Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet. With more than 2 million downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, and part of the Self-Help for Smart People podcast network. In this episode, we discuss happiness. Can the pursuit of happiness backfire? Why are people more depressed and more anxious than ever in a time when the world is physically safer and healthier than it's ever been in history? We look at the crisis of meaning in our society and examine how we can cultivate real meaning in our lives beyond ourselves and move towards an existence of purpose with our guest, Emily Esfahani-Smith. Do you need more time? Time for work? Time for thinking and reading? Time for the people in your life? Time to accomplish your goals? This was the number one problem our listeners outlined, and we created a new video guide that you can get completely for free when you sign up and join our email list. It's called How You Can Create Time for the Things That Really Matter in Life. You can get it completely for free when you sign up and join the email list at successpodcast.com. You're also going to get exclusive content that's only available to our email subscribers. We recently pre-released an episode and an interview to our email subscribers a week before it went live to our broader audience. And that had tremendous implications because there was a limited offer in there with only 50 available spots that got eaten up by the people who were on the email list first. With that same interview, we also offered an exclusive opportunity for people on our email list to engage one-on-one for over an hour with one of our guests in a live exclusive interview just for email subscribers. There's some amazing stuff that's available only to email subscribers that's only going on if you subscribe and sign up to the email list. You can do that by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage. Or if you're driving around right now, if you're out and about and you're on the go, you don't have time, just text the word SMARTER to the number 44222. That's S-M-A-R-T-E-R to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we discussed how the impossible becomes possible. We looked at how to create paradigm-shifting breakthroughs, dug into the science and research at the frontier of peak human performance to understand what's at the core of nearly every gold medal or world championship, the powerful concept of flow. We examine how to create flow in our lives, how you can use it as a tool to become 400% more creative, to learn skills 200% faster, and much more. We dug into all of that with our previous guest, Stephen Kotler. Now for our interview with Emily. Today, we have another exciting guest on the show, Emily Esfahani-Smith. Emily is a journalist, positive psychology instructor and author. She's a graduate of Dartmouth College and earned her Master's of Applied Positive Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Her articles have been read over 30 million times. Her TED Talk's been viewed over 1.3 million times, and her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Time, and much more. Emily, welcome to the Science of Success. Thanks for having me. Well, we're really excited to have you on the show today and really pumped to kind of dig into some of the things you talk about. So let's kind of start off with something that I think a lot of people almost assume as a given and don't even really question or kind of sort of drill back down and think about is, should we be pursuing happiness? So this is the question that motivated me to write my book, The The Power of Meaning. And actually, my book grew out of an article that I wrote for the Atlantic that was called, There's More to Life Than Being Happy. So I was in graduate school in positive psychology at the time, which is this field that kind of empirically studies the good life, meaning, happiness, things like that. And as I was learning that research, working as a journalist, and began to get really concerned and bothered by this message that we receive constantly in our culture, that a good life is a happy life and that we should pursue happiness. And that the whole thing that struck me as odd was because I knew so many people in my life, I knew so many people growing up who weren't focused on that pursuit. They were engaged in really stressful activities like their work, raising children, dealing with illnesses, helping in their communities. And they were stressed out. They were they would get frustrated. They weren't focused on their own happiness, and they weren't even you know happy much of the time. And yet, to me, there seemed to be a real value and significance in what they were doing. And then coming upon the research, it kind of confirmed my intuition, which was that 
there's this whole new body of work that shows that when we pursue happiness and prioritize it the way our culture encourages us to do, it's this very self-oriented pursuit and that it can make us actually unhappy and feel lonely. And in contrast, when we look to another way of leading our lives, one that's focused on the pursuit of meaningfulness or on doing things and contributing in ways that lie outside of yourself, that this is a much more fulfilling path and leads to kind of a deeper sense of satisfaction. So I want to explore that idea a little bit more, this kind of notion that the pursuit of happiness can somehow make us sort of happy or or sorry, (laughs) the pursuit of happiness can make us unhappy or potentially anxious. Okay. I think it's an interesting finding because you know, there's so much out there about, you know, 10 steps to happiness, all these books that you can buy to make yourself happier. And I think that there are two reasons, at least, why the pursuit of happiness can backfire. I think the first one is that we have really high expectations of what a happy life should be. So just really interestingly, from a historical perspective, our concept of happiness has changed over the course of Western civilization, but especially over the last 200 years where happiness used to mean kind of a state of leading a meaningful life. You know, you, happiness wasn't a positive emotion the way that we think of it today. Then about two, 300 years ago, the definition started changing to mean feeling, maximizing, you know, positive feelings and minimizing negative feelings. And so if that's your definition of happiness and you're expecting to be in that state all the time, you're going to be disappointed because feelings and emotions come and go. It's not possible to be happy all the time. The very definition of an emotion is that it's a fleeting state. So I think we have this unfair expectation for what a happy life should look like that's just not realistic. I think the other thing is that when you set your sights on the pursuit of happiness, it can put you in this mindset that very much focuses you on yourself because you're constantly evaluating, am I happy? Is this making me happy? Like, how is this affecting me? And that mindset takes you away from pursuing things that are actually deep and meaningful because those deep and meaningful things won't necessarily make you happy. And we know from the research that it's when you pursue the meaningful objectives and projects and relationships that you end up with a deeper sense of happiness down the road. So it's, it's kind of the very, this mindset that focuses on happiness takes you away from what's really important. And when you're taken away from what's really important, you're depriving yourself of this deeper sense of happiness that you, that you may want. And I think it's really interesting that the data, you know, supports this idea that, you know, in, in many senses, people are kind of the, physically the safest they've ever been objectively kind of living, you know, at the highest standard of living that they've ever been living at. And yet suicide rates are, are rising in many cases. People are sort of less happy despite being physically more comfortable and healthier, et cetera. Exactly. So when I came across that bit of research, it really surprised me. Basically, you know, human beings, Steven Pinker is a social psychologist who writes a lot about this, that by every, nearly every conceivable measure, if you look across the span of history, life has been getting better for human beings. You know, you're, you're much less likely to die from violent death than you were, you know, at any point in human history. Every year, millions of people are being lifted out of poverty. Quality of life has never been better for people. Less people die of sickness and and illness than they ever have before. It's a really good time to be alive. And yet, at the same time, there is this crisis of meaning that a lot of people are dealing with. And that's reflected in these rising suicide rates, rising rates of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. And what's really interesting is that when social scientists try to figure out what's driving these this rising tide of despair, this increase in suicide and and depression and what have you, they find that it's not a lack of happiness in life, but a lack of meaning. And I want to just say something more about this point because I think it's a little bit counterintuitive. I think when we look at somebody who's feeling depressed or or suicidal or anxious or whatever, or when we feel those ways ourselves, we think, okay, I feel bad. The solution is to feel better. That means making myself feel happier. In fact, that's not going to get you out of the rut. What's going to get you out of the rut is engaging in some sort of meaningful project because that's the way you get outside of your own head, outside of these voices that are telling you how bad you are, how terrible life is, and re-engaging 
with the world coming outside of yourself and realizing, well, actually, I, I do have a role to play. I am needed. Life, you know, the things I do matter. I had a professor of psychology in grad school who was also a clinical psychologist. In other words, he saw patients in addition to performing research. And he said something that really stuck with me, which is that one of the best cures for depression is going out and volunteering in your community because it gets you outside of your head and makes you feel like you're making a difference. So this kind of distinction between meaning and happiness, I think a lot of people might kind of conflate those things or even think that they're the same thing. Tell me about sort of what distinguishes meaning from happiness and how are they different? It's, it's such a good question. And when I first came upon this body of work distinguishing meaning and happiness, I think it was a light bulb moment for me because like many people, I thought I use those terms interchangeably. And yet I felt this dissatisfaction with the way our culture was talking about what a good life is about. And it occurred to me that once I was able to pull these terms apart and understand them as separate ways to lead a good life, that that dissatisfaction kind of went away. So it was, it was a clarifying. So happiness, as I alluded to earlier, it's a positive mental and emotional state. If you feel good, you're happy. If you feel bad, you're unhappy. And it's transient. It comes and goes. It lives in the moment. Meaning, though, is bigger. So psychologists say that the defining feature of leading a meaningful life is connecting and contributing to something beyond yourself. So for some people, that might mean raising their children or, or being involved in a family unit. For others, it might mean contributing to their communities, whether it's a church community, a religious community of any kind, their work community, or it could be you know, more cosmic than that, like feeling connected to God or nature or the universe. So that's kind of a defining feature of a meaningful life. And when people say their lives are meaningful in surveys and things like that, they list them as meaningful because three conditions have been satisfied. One is they believe their lives have a sense of worth and significance. So you think your life matters. The second is they believe their lives are driven by a sense of purpose. So there's some sort of goal or principle that is motivating them and driving them into the future. And finally, they think of their lives as coherent. So that means that when they look across their life, their own lives, and also when they look at the world in general, they don't see their experiences and the world around them as random occurrences, as you know, disconnected, as nonsensical, but they see what's happening around them as part of a larger whole that makes sense and that helps them understand why they are the way they are and why the world is the way it is. You know, obviously, I, your work it has been kind of Martin Seligman's research has been sort of foundational to much of the work that you've done. And, and when I read the book, Learned Happiness or Learned Optimism for the first time, one of the most kind of standout lines for me was this phrase. It's almost like a throwaway phrase towards the end of the book. But he just he says that the self is a very poor site for meaning. And I think that really underscores kind of what you've unearthed as well is this idea that in today's society, everybody's so caught up in sort of their own pursuit of me, me, me and happiness and self-focus when in reality, happiness, or well, not happiness, but meaning, see, I'm even conflating them now, meaning really derives from something much richer and something beyond you. It's sort of contributing or, or serving something beyond yourself. Exactly. No, I, I love that sentence from Marty's book that me, that the self is a poor seat for meaning. It's, it's exactly right. You have to connect to something beyond yourself. And that could be just an encounter with another person. I think for me, it's a constant lesson that I have to relearn, it seems, every single day that when I tune in to somebody else, you know, whether it's a stranger I'm kind of getting to know for the first time or having a conversation with my husband or my friend, that there's such a powerful bond, a meaningful bond that is formed when both people are present and listening to each other and truly there for one another that it just it kind of fills it fills you up and gives you that sense of fulfillment so i think one of the things about meaning is that we think it's this huge thing that you have to find your capital m at meaning but when you think of it in terms of what marty is saying it, it lies outside yourself you find that there are lots of ways that you can search for meaning and find it in your day-to-day -day life 
that's a really, really key point and, and something that I think personally I've definitely gotten kind of tripped up on and I think it's easy for people to get tripped up on is this idea that, you know, you have to find, as you call it, a capital M meaning. You have to sort of spend, you know, days, weeks, years trying to figure out what's the purpose of my life when in reality, in many cases, it's kind of the small moments that really help build towards that. Exactly. I was talking to someone the other day who grew up Buddhist and, you know, he's a serial entrepreneur now, um, but he had this kind of Buddhist way of looking at things. And we were talking about meaning and he said something that I thought was really powerful, which is that living a meaningful life is about doing whatever you're doing in the present moment well. So being a parent, doing that well, washing the dishes, doing it well, this podcast, doing it well. So there's something about just this act of kind of mastery that takes us outside of ourselves and that gives us a sense of pride and fulfillment. So in today's society, you know, a lot of our kind of major social institutions and things that people used to kind of ascribe to and and derive meaning from beyond themselves, things like, you know, even sort of the nation, the country, you know, patriotism used to be such a bigger thing. Religion is obviously, you know, eroded tremendously. Sort of the family unit has kind of eroded. How do we think about cultivating, creating meaning in kind of a society in a world where all of those previous kind of pillars of meaning have eroded and, and people are in many ways adrift now? That, that is the problem of being a person in, in the modern world. It's kind of the central existential problem. There were all these sources of meaning that were kind of default sources of meaning. You didn't have to, it's not like you were choosing to be, for most people anyways, choosing to be, you know, to ascribe to certain religious dogmas or choosing to identify with your with your nation. That was just part of the water, you know, the air that you were breathing and it kind of conferred meaning in life. And you see that when you go to, countries that are not yet developed. So, you know, third world countries where they haven't experienced modernity yet, they still are very much living in that world. They get so much meaning from religion in their communities and their, 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 their tribes or their, their sense of nation. And it, in those countries too, you find that there's lower suicide rates and, and all these other markers of, of a crisis of meaning don't exist there as, as they do in the modern world, in the, excuse me, in, in developed countries. So the question is, you know, what do we do about that? And I think that one answer is clear. It's, you know, it's, we don't want to go back to a time where the material circumstances of our lives are worse, but we have more meaning in our lives. You know, we want countries like Sierra Leone, where there is this high sense of meaning, but it's so poor. We want them to kind of enter into the modern world so they can have a higher quality of life. So then if you don't want to move backwards, how do you move forwards? And I think that it's the existential philosophers like Nietzsche, like, like Sartre, they talk about this, that in the modern world, the challenge of being alive is the challenge of choosing to find meaning on your own. So there's a million paths ahead of you. It can be overwhelming. There's no default path to meaning anymore. So you have to choose. And that can feel overwhelming, but it's a responsibility that we each have to take. And one of the things that motivated me to write my book was trying to understand, okay, if you are at that fork in the road, when you're trying to figure out which path do you take to lead a meaningful life, are there certain things, certain pillars, let's say, that you can lean on that will help you find meaning in your life. And there were, you know, in my research, I, I, I kind of interviewed a bunch of people, read thousands really of pages of research, psychology, philosophy, literature, you, you name it. And I started noticing that there were these four themes that came up again and again in the stories people told me and in the research that I was reading. And they are what I think of as the wellsprings of meaning. So whatever path you choose, these four things, a combination of them, or maybe all four of them are what bring meaning to our lives. So the first one is belonging. So having a sense of belonging, being in communities and relationships where you feel valued for who you are intrinsically and where you value other people in turn. The second one is something I mentioned briefly earlier, and, and it's purpose. So purpose is about making having something worthwhile to do with your time. And what that often means is having some, some kind of pursuit or project that involves making a contribution to the world. So maybe your purpose is to you know find a cure for cancer. But a lot of people have more 
local purposes, more kind of humble purposes that are equally powerful for them, like raising their children, being a good person. There's a study that shows that kids who do chores around the house have a stronger sense of purpose. And it's kind of a wonderful example of what what that guy I said was telling us about, that meaning comes from doing something in the moment and doing it well. Well, for the chores, I think what was going on is that the kids felt like they were part of a larger project, which was helping with the, you know, maintaining of the household, helping their parents out. And it was this thing that made them feel useful and valued. The third pillar is transcendence. And these are those moments when your sense of self starts to turn down or turn off completely. And you feel connected to something much bigger than yourself, whether it's nature, the universe, humanity as a whole, God, you know, you know, people have these experiences during meditation, listening to music, going to an art museum and, and kind of having an encounter with beauty. So they, there are a lot of different ways to experience transcendence. And then the final one is storytelling. And storytelling goes back to what I was saying about coherence earlier. And it's when I'm talking about storytelling, what I'm really talking about is the story that you tell yourself about yourself, about how you became the person that you are today. So, you know, I think that's a framework that I kind of presented in my book, that if you want to lead a meaningful life, try to cultivate these pillars of belonging, purpose, transcendence, and storytelling, and that will set you on your way. This week's episode is brought to you by our partners at Brilliant. Brilliant is a math and science enrichment learning tool. You can learn concepts by solving fascinating, challenging problems. Brilliant explores probability, computer science, machine learning, the physics of everyday life, complex algebra, and much more. They do this with addictive, interactive experiences that are enjoyed by over 5 million students, professionals, and enthusiasts around the world. But one of the coolest things that I really also like about Brilliant is that they have these learning principles. And two of them in particular really kind of stick out to me as powerful and important principles. One of them is that learning is curiosity driven. And if you look at some of the most prolific thinkers and learners in history, people like Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, they were incredibly curious individuals, just really, really curious. And it's so great to see that one of their learning principles is this principle of curiosity. Another one of Brilliant's learning principles that's absolutely critical is that learning needs to allow for failure. And if you look at Carol Dweck, if you look at the research behind mindset, this is one of the cornerstones of psychology research. You have to be able to fail to learn and improve. You have to be able to acknowledge your weaknesses. You have to be able to push yourself into a place where it's okay to make mistakes. These learning principles form the cornerstone of the foundation of Brilliant. It's such a great platform. I highly recommend checking it out. You can do that by going to brilliant.org slash science of success. I'm a huge fan of STEM learning, and that's why I'm so excited that Brilliant is sponsoring this episode. They've been a sponsor of the show for a long time, and there's a reason. They make learning math and science fun and engaging and exciting. You can get started today with Brilliant by going to brilliant.org slash science of success. That's brilliant.org slash science of success. If you've been enjoying our weekly Riddles in Mindset Monday, we're also collaborating with Brilliant to bring some awesome and exciting riddles to our Mindset Monday email list. Let's dig in a little bit more, uh, you know, maybe starting with kind of belonging. How can we better cultivate or find that belonging, you know, coming back to this idea we talked about before in a world where oftentimes it feels like, you know, there's those traditional ways that people used to find it have kind of eroded or evaporated? You know, for me, there are two ways that I I go about this in in my own life. The one is, is what I was talking about earlier, which is just forming these intimate micro connections with other people. I think it's so easy to go through life basically objectifying others. I don't mean it even in a sexual sense. And we usually use that term objectifying in a sexual sense. So what I mean is just the other person is just an object in your periphery and you don't really see them for who they are. And, and, and the fact that they have a whole story, a whole history that if you just knew a little bit about it would bring you two closer together. So, you know, I was at a conference this weekend where there were a bunch of people I didn't know. And I'm, you know, someone who's kind of introverted, that's, it's always a little bit intimidating, you know, of a situation. But 
So this goes back to what I said earlier about this lesson that I have to learn over and over again. As soon as you start talking to people, you know, on a deep level, expressing interest in them, forming this micro connection, it's, they open up and then you open up. And then there's this bond of belonging that forms between you that can be really powerful. Maybe you don't see them again, but you know, for the rest of your life, maybe you stay in touch, who knows? Maybe they become the person that you like end up marrying. But in that moment, that bond of belonging forms and it's powerful. And so recognizing that belonging is a choice that we make and it lives in the moment and that we can choose to cultivate it with another person just by the presence that we bring to a conversation. The second thing is, yes, a lot of the old communities are dying, but there are ways to form new ones. And I would encourage people to kind of take the leadership, to take the initiative to do this in your own life, whether it's at work or, or just in your own community. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example. So I'm involved with this project called the Ben Franklin Circles. And these are basically small groups of people that meet all around the country to talk about values and, and character and what it means to lead a good life. Um, Franklin, our, our founding father, of course, had these 13 virtues that he thought were critical ingredients to leading a meaningful life. And the virtues include things like humility and industriousness and frugality. And some of them are super old fashioned, like chastity. And the idea is that each meeting we get together and we talk about one of these ideas, one of these virtues, and whether it's still relevant in modern life and how it's still relevant in modern life. So I run one of these circles here in Washington, D.C., and we meet about once a month, once every two months. And what was really powerful to me as I started doing this is how quickly a community formed and how quickly people were willing to make themselves intimate and vulnerable to each other. I mean, these were like strangers beforehand. And then almost immediately, we were able to form a community. And the reason, I think, is because we were gathering together to talk about this common interest that we have and what it means to lead a good life. And two, to talk about things that really matter to us, like values and virtues and character. And, you know, to do it in Washington, D.C. is especially powerful because right now there's so much in our country and in this city in particular that's tearing people apart. And doing this group was a reminder that whatever our political differences are, whatever our religious differences are, no matter where we're from in the country, there is a common set of values that we share. And if we come together around those values, we can really cultivate belonging. I love that example. And it's, it's such a great way to kind of take responsibility for, you know, proactively kind of creating that belonging within your own life. I'd love to dig into this concept of storytelling as well. That seems really, really interesting to me. And, you know, how can we go about sort of changing the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves? I think the thing to the first thing we have to remember with storytelling that helps us in that process of changing the story is recognizing that we're telling a story. So I think that we don't always realize that we are creating this constant narrative in our heads about who we are, about why this or that event happened to us, why this person said that to us, how our childhood affected us. There's kind of all these little stories that we tell about just daily occurrences, and then also the broader story of our narrative arc that we're telling. We don't always realize that we're telling a story. We think that, oh, like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and all of a sudden, here I am. Um, but really, we're making narrative and interpretive choices about what details we include in the story and which ones we don't include because it would be impossible to include every single detail in that narrative. And so it may be that as we're making those narrative choices, we end up telling a story that holds us back rather than moves us forward. So let me give you an example. There's a few different types of stories that psychologists find that people tell about themselves. One of them is called a contamination story. So a story that moves from good things happening to bad things happening. So you know, in the research, there was, I remember one example coming up of a woman who met this man, they were going to have the baby together. It was really, really wonderful. And then he died unexpectedly. And that was the story that she told. So it was really good. Then it went to really bad. People who tell stories like that, it turns out, are more anxious and depressed and believe their lives are less meaningful. So that's the kind of story that 
would perhaps hold you back because you you kind of in this negative mindset, you dwell on it, you ruminate, you're not able to move into the future in a healthy way. Another kind of story, the opposite from a contamination story is a redemptive story. So a story that moves from bad things happening to good things happening. And let's take that same example. So let's say that you have the same woman and she says, you know, I met this man. It was wonderful. We had a child together and he died. And it was terrible. I was traumatizing. Like I, he was the love of my life. I didn't have him anymore. And then my child no longer had a father. I I felt like I didn't know what I was going to do. But then, you know, as time went on, I realized that this experience, as difficult as it was, made me grow in so many ways. It deepened my spiritual life. It made me realize what my true purpose was because, you know, he died of cancer and I started doing activism work in cancer centers and groups. And it was horrible, but given that it happened, it made me grow in all these ways. So that would be a redemptive story. There's a terrible thing that happens, but she finds a silver lining in it that makes the suffering seem worthwhile in some way, even though all things being equal, she still wouldn't have wanted her husband to have died. And people who tell stories like that, redemptive stories, they rate their lives as more meaningful. So there are these types of stories that we can tell that are more conducive to leading whole meaningful lives. A redemptive story is one of them. There are other kinds of stories as well. Stories that are defined by love as the theme, stories of agency. In other words, stories where you're in control and making things happen and where you feel like your life matters. And stories of growth, which is, you know, like the one I just said. So so the themes can overlap as well. The question then is, okay, if you're telling a bad story, how do you start telling one that's better? And there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. I mean, some people go to a therapist, they seek out professional help, and that's really helpful to them. But I think that, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can reflect on your story and do the work on your own too. If you're willing to be introspective, put the time and effort into it. So there's a really rich body of research around narrative writing. So sitting down and writing about your most difficult experiences for 15 minutes a day for three to four days in a row. And it turns out that people who do that end up finding more meaning in what happened to them as those three or four days go on. And they end up finding some sort of positive meaning, specifically some sort of silver lining. So if they start by telling a contamination story, they end by telling a redemptive story. I mean, and this isn't for everyone, of course, but it's for for a statistically significant amount of people. So what does that tell us? I think it tells us that writing, journaling, reflecting on your experiences in a deep and sustained way is one way to change your story. And I'll just add too, as a final point for this, that it's not going to happen overnight. You know, in, in these studies, it was 15, 15 minutes, three or four days in a row. But I think for a lot of people, it's going to be a process, especially when it comes to the more difficult experiences, a process that can take years to work through. I think it's fascinating that you can look at sort of two completely opposite perspectives on the same event, right? And you can kind of tell yourself these almost polar opposite stories. And the story that you tell yourself about it has a substantial impact on your own kind of emotional state, your reaction and and your behavior, even, you know, in many cases can be years down the road. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it affects your health. I mean, the, those studies that I talked about, where they're writing for three to four days, they with one of the major findings is that the people who did that were healthier later on. They were less likely to be sick. They measured their blood. Their immune system was in a better shape. So it's the, the effect is pretty profound. So I want to changing gears a little bit. I want to look at kind of the the current culture that we have around ambition and success, and try to reconcile the pursuit of you know, those kinds of things with the pursuit of meaning in your mind, are those things kind of conflicting or could they have sort of a healthy relationship with one another? That's yeah. It's a really interesting question. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. I think there is this sense in our culture that among a certain group of people who, who are, you know, maybe what we would call, you know, part of the elite that, you have to accomplish, you have to be successful, that leading a meaningful life is about achieving certain sorts of credentials, like going to a good school, getting a certain type of job, buying a house, get, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, getting that promotion, making it to the C-suite, you know, on and on it goes. And you're kind of constantly looking up the ladder, you know, not realizing that there's, you know, there are people ahead of you having this competitive mindset, they're trying to get ahead. And I think that that can be a really 
damaging way to think about how to lead your life. I mean, it's the reason why I think people are experiencing so much burnout. I think it's a big part of why there's so much spiritual emptiness among people as well. It, it helps. It, it's part of why we have a meaning crisis is because we define our worth and our sense of significance in terms of our career success. And the problem with that is that when we're not successful and not all of us will be, we're not going to all accomplish our dreams and, and, and become, you know, the people we hope we will become in terms of our careers. There's this real reckoning that happens. And, and we were forced to conclude that, oh, maybe my life isn't worthwhile because I, I didn't do all these things and all my friends are doing them and I'm not doing them. So I think, I think there's a real problem there. And I think that the solution to it is redefining success more in terms of leading a meaningful life. So a psychologist from the 20th century who I think is helpful here, his name is Eric Erickson. And Erickson thought of life as a series of developmental stages. So as you go through life, your job is to master certain developmental tasks. So when you're young, for example, you're learning how to trust other people and trust the world around you. As you become a teenager, you're trying to figure out who you are and what your purpose is. As you become a middle-aged adult, the task is to become generative. The, this word he coins called generativity. And what it means is that you're making a contribution to your society. So if in the first half of life, you're thinking about how you can, you know, what you, what you are, who you are and what your purpose is in the second half of life, you're thinking about how to help other people rise up, how to mentor them, how to raise children, how to be a community leader. And for him, that is the definition of, of success and of leading a meaningful life. So I think that if you're caught in this mindset of I need to succeed, I need to accomplish, I need to climb that ladder and it's unfulfilling to you, maybe, or if, if you're caught in that mindset and you didn't succeed and you, you feel like a failure in some regard, maybe reframing what success is about would be helpful and reframing it in terms of not winning all the time, but of being a person who contributes to others and who helps other people move along in their path. I think that's a great definition. And it's funny. I mean, I think in many ways, our, our show title, The Science of Success, it can be misleading at times because it's not just about kind of the traditional trappings of success. It's really much more about when we talk about success, it's that definition that you're talking about. It's living a meaningful life. It's doing what you want to do in your life. It's not necessarily just the acquisition of fame or money or reputation or whatever. But for listeners who want to kind of concretely implement some of the ideas and, and things that we've talked about today, what would be kind of one piece of homework or one action item that you would give them as an action step to sort of implement some of the ideas we've discussed? You know, I talked about writing earlier and, and journaling, and I think it kind of gets a bad rap, because especially today when there's like, you know, you know, gratitude journal, your best self journal, it can kind of seem a little hokey. But I think there's something to be said about you know, having a Google Doc on your computer or having a, a pad of paper where you can sit down and write about the things that you're trying to process, whether that's your definition of success, some experience of failure that you had that was really painful, a moment of adversity that you're trying to overcome, and just sitting and writing about it and reflecting on it in a deep and sustained way for maybe 20 minutes a week. I think that that's a really powerful way to build meaning and to develop wisdom as well, which is a really critical component of leading a meaningful life. And for listeners who want to find you and your work online, what's the best place to, for them to find you? I'm on Twitter. My handle is at M Esfahani Smith. And I also have a website, Emily Smith.com. You can also find my author page on Facebook. Well, Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing all this wisdom. I think a really important conversation around how we kind of have misconceived of happiness and how we can really focus more around creating meaning in our lives. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T -T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you and I read and respond to every single listener email. 
I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.